This is our second episode of West Virginia and we're going to explore what makes it wonderful. This is the West Virginia State Capitol complex and behind me is the West Virginia State Capitol. Uh, it's got a gold dome and it is absolutely gorgeous, probably the most gorgeous state capitol in the entire United States. However, right now it's all wrapped up because they're doing construction on it. But there's plenty to do on this complex. Prior to the American Civil War, West Virginia was part of the state of Virginia. But after Virginia succeeded from the Union, the northwestern counties which remained loyal to the Union ultimately separated themselves and the state of West Virginia was formed. In addition to the Capitol building, the plaza contained several other important buildings including the West Virginia Governor's Mansion. On the other side of the plaza, you'll find the West Virginia Veterans Memorial. This two-story structure honors the more than 10,000 West Virginians who died for the sake of our country. The walls are filled with the names of fallen soldiers who perished during the four major military conflicts of the 20th century. Each name is etched in stone to ensure that their sacrifice will be remembered for generations to come. The outer walls continue to pay tribute to the armed forces of our country with statues representing the various branches of military. The monument is surrounded by a reflecting pool which serves as an ideal place to contemplate gratitude for the freedoms which others helped secure for us. The entire plaza helps pay tribute to the history of this state and is also the home of the West Virginia State Museum. Upon entering the museum, you're greeted by a large hall which often hosts events and contains a mesmerizing display of quilts by West Virginia artisans. You then travel down to the museum main display which literally walks you through the entire history of this state. Their impressive tableaus really help bring the story of West Virginia to life and some scenes even incorporate animatronics. To ensure you don't get bored on this trip through time, they've also included a number of interactive displays along the way so you can really take on the roles of the other heirs. West Virginia has a lot to be proud of, and its capital city is a great place to start your journey and get excited about all there is to experience here. Pies and Pints in downtown Charleston, and I was continuously told I need to come to this place. So we're getting ready to try it out, and it is called Pies and Pints. So uh, we're going to give it a shot here and see what it's like. 
It's easy to see why Pies and Pints was so heavily recommended to me. Both the pizza and beer selections are phenomenal, and the staff is incredibly friendly and helpful. They offered up some great recommendations. The whole place has a really fun vibe and its location on Capitol Street can't be beat. In fact, the downtown Charleston area is a lot of fun to walk around. Depending which area you go to, you can find some amazing restaurants and maybe even run across some really cool murals and street art. One of my favorite areas to walk around Charleston is right by the water. If you're here in the summer, you might even catch one of their fantastic Live on the Levee events. Every Friday evening from Memorial Day through Labor Day, they have bands, food trucks, and other great outdoor activities. Best of all, it's free to attend. After walking around for a while, we needed a little pick-me-up. So we drove back down Capitol Street to the appropriately titled Capitol Street Market. The market has several different vendors. Outside, you'll find florists and landscape artists. We got caught up looking at some beautiful arrangements by Legacy Farms. Inside the market, there's a variety of different vendors specializing in chocolate, wine, and various local goods that one would traditionally find at a farmer's market. We, however, had coffee on the mind, so we went directly to Mia Cuppa, where the barista recommended a pour over that was legitimately delicious. Once we were good and hopped up on caffeine, we were ready to explore one of Charleston's most active spaces. So we took a trip over to the Clay Center for the arts and sciences. The Clay Center has a lot to offer visitors of all ages, but is an extra special treat for smaller humans who have yet to become jaded by the ravages of time. It's hard to know where to look first when you step inside this bustling center, but one piece that immediately draws your eye is the large climbing bridge which extends up to the ceiling and right next to it, a large kinetic sculpture bobs along to a steady rhythm. Speaking of rhythm, your little one can work on making their own inside the Clay Center's music studio. This display helps explain some of the science behind music and sound and gives kids a chance to make some noise of their own. Right next to the studio is Waterworks. Waterworks is one of the center's newest exhibits and most popular. The kids here thought they were just having fun, but they were accidentally learning about the science and power of water at the same time. Suckers! Not that I can blame them, this exhibit really is fascinating and all of the interactive elements are so much fun to play with. The happy sounds of children playing with the water would almost make you think we were inside an amusement park rather than a science center. And hey, remember when you were little and it was fun to pretend you had a job? The Clay Center has the ultimate playset. It's their very own small town. Kids love pretending to work on cars without the risk of permanently damaging your most expensive object or hassle of haggling with the mechanic. Or remember when the idea of getting an MRI was fun instead of a terrifying symbol of your eventual demise? All the seemingly endless and mind-numbing chores of adulthood became fun through kids' eyes. Even politics and run-ins with police get to be a fun game instead of something to yell at each other during family meals. All joking aside, this is an amazing resource for kids and a good reminder to adults that a lot of happiness is just about perspective. The upstairs of the Clay Center hosts more traditional galleries, but the exhibits when we were there were anything but traditional. This display was like a glitter bomb come to life. The show turned the whole room into a magical collage of stuffed animals, origami, and sparkles. I had no idea there could be so many variations of unicorns in one place, but this artist found some really creative interpretations of the magical beast. She even made one unicorn horn out of corn. Try saying that three times fast.
The larger gallery featured a show dedicated to celebrating music. The black and white photos of the exhibit were a nice contrast to the colorful explosions of the other room. Although these exhibits will likely be replaced by the time you make your trip, the Clay Center is constantly celebrating different forms of artistic expression and you're sure to see something unique. I'm in downtown Charleston at a new craft distillery called Mountain State Distillery. And Jeff Arthur is the proprietor. And Jeff, tell me what kind of stuff you make. We make whiskey, and we make a couple of different flavors of whiskey, and we make straight moonshine. And uh, we'll have a few other flavors of moonshine coming out uh, in, in the future. But right now, it's just straight corn liquor. Sounds good. The place is really neat, and it's in a neat location in Charleston. It's right on the corner of Capitol Street and Canal Boulevard, so it's right in the heart of downtown Charleston. So there's a lot of food and things to go nearby as well. A lot of West Virginia stereotypes are really unfounded, but the state does have a history of knowing how to make some really good moonshine. If you're interested in learning more about the history of moonshine in the state, then definitely stop in at Mountain State Distillery. Jeff's family has been a part of this culture for generations and that history really comes through the product they make. Their moonshine is strong and their whiskey is smooth. Both are worth your time to sample, plus it's always fun to visit distilleries of different sizes and see their own unique process in action. Now for a quick tour of Blanco Glass, West Virginia's most well-known glass maker. Located in Milton, West Virginia, the Blinko Visitor Center is a great place to see some glass blowing in action or pick up a unique gift for yourself or a friend. Blinko has been a family business since 1893 and their reputation and dedication to craftsmanship have helped them survive in a world that is increasingly geared towards the mass produced. Their products aren't just aesthetic, however. Blinko specializes in functional glass products in addition to all manners of plates and vases. They also have lighting fixtures and more architectural glass. Upstairs, you'll find some of their amazing stained glass windows which pay tribute to important historical moments and you'll also have a chance to learn a little bit more about the history of the company. This is also where you'll find a bridge leading to the observation area. Here you can see firsthand how these craftsmen make these exquisite pieces. The process of glass blowing involves a lot of heat, so a safety barrier limits how close you can get to the workers. But it is really cool to see how these glowing orbs of glass transform into beautiful works of art. They don't keep the glass at Blanco strictly indoors. Outside they have a small garden full of glass bricks and other exterior pieces as well as several brightly colored flowers. This is a great showcase of the creations of both man and nature living in harmony. Now I'm going to take you for a cultural experience into the Huntington Museum of Art. The Huntington Museum of Art was opened to the public in 1952. They've made it their mission to help visitors discover, learn, and create. And as far as I can tell, they're doing a fantastic job. Their firearms collection was one of the earliest donations to the museum and really showcases these items both for their history and their craftsmanship. And while this collection is often on display, Many of their other galleries host rotating exhibits. Sometimes these exhibits draw exclusively from their vast permanent collection of over 16,000 objects, but often they're supplemented with loans from other institutions and collectors. When we visited, they had a dazzling display of craftsmanship in the forms of both quilting and glassware.
collection of works here is impressive, but one of the most unique aspects of this museum is the Fred C. Edwards Conservatory. It is the only plant conservatory in West Virginia and makes good on the museum's mission to be a proponent for nature. The plants and animals in this conservatory traditionally live in tropical and subtropical climates, but thanks to this place, the people of West Virginia can experience them as well. Even though visitors shouldn't pick any of the plants themselves, many of the plants here are edible and include bananas, papaya, and coffee. The conservatory also houses an amazing glass sculpture created at the Chihuly Studios that we unfortunately aren't able to show you due to copyright restrictions, but I guess you'll just need to go there yourself to see it. If you've heard of the movie We Are Marshall, well behind me is the memorial fountain for the Marshall football team that lost their lives back on November 14, 1970. The fountain was created by sculptor Harry Bertoya. It stands over 13 feet high and weighs over 6,000 pounds. The waters of the fountain are intended to celebrate living and the immortality we gain through community. In addition to the Memorial Fountain, the rest of the Marshall Campus is a great place to walk around with beautiful flowers and a general sense of possibilities to come. This is Harris Riverfront Park and it's a great place to come and chill. I get a look at the Ohio River across the way is Ohio, but we're of course in Huntington, West Virginia. And uh, you can bring your family, there's a place for kids to play. Uh, they hold festivals here. Uh, there's all kinds of things to do here. This park has a fantastic playground for the kids and the large open areas of this place make it a great place to bring a picnic and look out over the water. It's often utilized in the summers to host concerts and boat races. Other times of the year, it's just a fantastic place to walk along the Ohio River or just chill out and enjoy the view. This is Ritter Park. It's a large open air park. Um, it's obviously not as big as Central Park in New York City, but it's Huntington's version of Central Park. Uh, there's a walking trail that goes all the way around it. Uh, lots of walkers, runners, um, just big grassy area, uh, and a rose garden up on top of the hill. Ritter Park is a popular place for weddings, pickup frisbee games, and all other sorts of activities. The grounds of the park host some really interesting outdoor sculptures as well as picnic tables, a playground, grilling spots, and a 1,000 seat amphitheater. And if you're into sports, it is also the home to the appropriately named Ritter Park Tennis Center, which is open to the public and houses 11 outdoor courts and 4 indoor ones for when you need to get a game in when the weather is less than agreeable. One of the park's main attractions is the Rose Garden. Depending on the time of the year, this garden could potentially feature over 3,000 roses and it's no wonder it has consistently been voted one of the best rose gardens in the entire country. The garden is open to the public and is a favorite for wedding photos, but if you're looking to keep things more exclusive, you can reserve the garden via the Greater Huntington Park and Recreation Rental Program. All these outdoor activities were making us hungry, so we went over to Pullman Square in search of food. Pullman Square is a great little shopping area which often hosts small outdoor concerts. I'm at the Black Sheep restaurant, getting ready to have a flock of tacos, and I have a Bad Shepherd beer. I'll let you know how it is. 
Black Sheep had a really fun theme and the food to match. Their taco selection was extremely varied and even had several options for our vegetarian cameraman and their wide beer selection made for some great pairings. They offered an option called Flock of Tacos which lets you mix and match any three of their tacos. Delish. In Huntington, you have two drive-in options, Frost Top and Stewart's. And it's almost like you're either for Marshall University or WVU if you're in sports. But in the case of this, you're either for Frost Top or Stewart's. Both are fantastic drive-ins and both are really, really old and have managed to succeed for decades. Stewart's hot dogs are pretty famous around this area, and for the price, it's hard to beat this little piece of nostalgia. Some former residents of Huntington have even gone as far to have Stewart's shipped to them when they get a little homesick. This is a great place to get some comfort food. In their peak, Frost Top could be found all over the country, but now this is one of the few that remain. The menu and cost are on par with Stewart's, so when the nearby Marshall team wins a game, it's a tough choice to decide where to celebrate. We're at Heritage Farms Museum, and this is a place that will totally take you back in time. Heritage Farms with Josh Wilson and Josh uh, tell me about what Heritage Farms is all about. Well Heritage Farm is comprised of uh, many different museums. We've got a museum of progress, of transportation, of industry. Uh, we've got a doll museum, we've got a country store, uh, we've got a children's museum that's all hands-on. Some museums you can go in and, and just look at the exhibits, you're not allowed to touch them, but we've actually got one that's geared for children. They can go in and, and touch exhibits and interact with things as well. All sorts of different places uh, here on the farm for people of all ages to learn things. Founded in 1973, Heritage Farms started primarily with a hobby of antiquing and a fascination about what it took to build a log cabin. What started as a private one barn collection is now a massive expanse which aims to bring about an appreciation for the traditions and heritage of Appalachia. The farm is a popular destination for field trips and is so expansive we only had time to visit a fraction of the exhibits. The Museum of Progress was our first stop and its displays do a great job of giving a visual representation of how everyday life has changed in this area over the years. Plus it has some really cool model trains which I think you're never too old to get excited about. By now you probably know I'm a transportation junkie and the Farms Museum of Transportation didn't disappoint. Their biplane and old Fords are a must see. In an age where we buy so much online and avoid personal contact at all costs, the old general store is really interesting to see. It's amazing to see some of the old products and labeling lining the shelves, but I wouldn't recommend trying to shoplift any candy from this place as I think the shelf life for some of these wares has long since passed. One of the newer exhibits here is their coal mining display. In addition to models and tools of the industry that has fueled the West Virginia economy for so long, they also have an interactive display which allows you to crawl through a replica mine and gives you a real sense of the cramped working conditions someone might have to endure in a coal mine. And what would a farm be without animals? Heritage Farm has a wonderful petting zoo with all sorts of friendly creatures looking to greet you. Just came out of the block, and not the prison block, the block restaurant, and had the kale salad with scallops, and it was to die for.
We would have loved to have shown you the famous Greenbrier Hotel too, but time has cut us short. Located in White Sulphur Springs, this location has been a destination for its healing waters since the 1700s. The original hotel was built in 1858, and the current structure has been in existence since 1910. This is not a budget travel destination. Expect to be treated like royalty here. In fact, 26 of the 45 U.S. presidents have stayed at this hotel. You can take a tour of the declassified underground bunker for Congress at the hotel as well. As you can see from both this and our previous episode, West Virginia has some amazing things. Since the 1950s, if something was built in West Virginia with federal dollars, there was an excellent chance that Senator Robert Byrd helped get the funding. More than $7.3 billion over his career as Senator. In fact, according to ABC News, his final year in office, he had 89 earmarks for that fiscal year, worth more than $250 million for West Virginia. Getting money for his home state was a legacy which Senator Byrd was proud. He was also the longest serving senator in history, in office for more than 51 years. CBS News stated that you ask any West Virginian to name someone else who has done more for the 1.8 million who live here, and there's usually silence. I can't name them all as it would require an entire episode to go through them, maybe even more than that. But some highlights are IAFIS, which is the National Fingerprint Center, the U.S. Treasury Bureau of Public Debt, and one of my favorites, the Coast Guard Operations. You get it, don't you? Coast Guard, West Virginia as a landlocked state, that's how you know your state has the best senator, when he can pull off something like this. I hope you enjoyed our feature on the great state of West Virginia. If I seemed a little biased, well, it's because I'm a native of West Virginia and this is my hometown. Although I don't live here anymore, I still love this place.